my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Hunter, one of my colleagues. We had the distinction oh, two years ago, two years plus now, of being selected a National Transportation Center of Excellence. Uh, it's been a, a long-ranging aspiration, a long-time aspiration, so we're very pleased to have been successful in that regard. And Dr. Hunter uh, is a professor in civil and environmental engineering, um, heads that initiative up for Georgia Institute of Technology, and I have the pleasure of serving as his deputy. Uh, he's pretty good, I'll say that, tongue-in-cheek. Uh, having said that, Michael is going to give you an overview of the center, some of the research initiatives, and then he's going to chair uh, our next uh, panel, which looks at mega regions and freight case studies. So, Dr. Hunter. Thank you. And, and Catherine is no one's deputy director. I've, <laughs> I've learned that. Uh, like I said, we're going to chair the next session, mega regions and freight case studies, evidence from research practice. Uh, first, I want to tell you a little bit about the center at Georgia Tech. So Georgia Tech does have a National Transportation Institute, a University Transportation Center, and some of the mega region work we do at Georgia Tech falls under that center. Look at that. So we have the, the National Center for Transportation Systems Productivity and Management, uh, the NCTSPM. We did work very hard to come up with an acronym you could not pronounce. <laughs> the, again, the, the purpose of our center is really threefold. We cover safety, economic competitiveness, and transportation infrastructure and state of good repair. And these all fall very well within the mega regions concept. And they also, as we look at them, as we tackle, we're really looking at the interaction of these different themes. Our goal is not necessarily to do an isolated safety project or an isolated economic competitiveness project, but to understand that there is interaction between safety and economic competitiveness. There's interaction between how, the st how your state of good repair your transportation infrastructure and services and economic competitiveness. And really try to bring those pieces together. Uh, the, center, the, the center itself is actually led by Georgia Tech, but we have three other partners on our center. Florida International University, University of Central Florida, and University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, we have a number of state partners. We have uh, the DOTs from all the different states are involved. The Atlanta, Atlanta Regional Commission has been involved. The Georgia uh, Transportation Institute is involved. We have a number of active research projects. We list 22 on this slide with 22 different PIs involved, although in about the next 10 days, that number will jump up to 40. So we just went through a second round of project selection and we'll be announcing those hopefully the end of this week or very early next week. So we're very excited about that and where the center's going. Uh, the centers, and you've probably heard of some of these centers across the country, uh, in this original selection, there were 22 centers that were selected. Uh, ten of them were national, and Georgia Tech has one of the national centers, and we're very proud of that. There are also ten regional centers. Uh, the regional center for our region is actually out of the University of Florida, and Georgia Tech is a partner on that center as well. Uh, and then the other two centers are actually transit centers. There was another competition that occurred uh, this last summer. You may have seen some, some news releases on that. And Georgia Tech, again, is also very proud that we are a member of the Davis Center that just was announced. So we're very excited about the university transportation programs and where they work. We're very uh, happy with the support. We're, we're very appreciative of the support that we received from FHWA and from RITA specifically. Uh, we have key objectives when you try to do these type of centers, when you try to do this work. Uh, on, on a broad base, we want to make sure we're doing multidisciplinary work. This is not, you know, uh, as we said, we're looking at the interaction between these themes. So you need a lot of people involved doing a lot of different things. Uh, we also want to make sure that as a university, and as a center, that we're really disseminating our research results and we're making a difference. Our point is not to write a research report and have it end up on a shelf and collect dust. We really want to have the technology transfer part. We really need to get out there. And this is part of that, right? This is part of making sure you're reaching out, that you're having an impact, that you're really trying to influence and improve the way things work. Uh, we also, obviously as a center at a university, we're very interested in transportation, uh, education, professional development. And a big part of that in, in these centers is also the K through 12 aspect. It's very important that very early you reach out and you let people see and, and you show the different students, you show the younger, right, the folks who are going to be running our system in the next 30 years, right? Get them interested in STEM education, show that they can do this, you know, get some excitement in the, in the path. And so we're reaching out, we're doing a lot of different work on that side. We're very making sure we're promoting diversity in our workforce, diversity, has many different flavors, right? It's, it's the people in the room, it's the way you look at different projects in the room, the attitudes you're bringing to it, the background, the experience. Uh, making sure this center is a national resource for debate. Right here, we're showing that I believe we're doing that very well. And exploring also international activities. Again, there's a lot we can learn from our partners abroad. 
This just is a really quick overview of what we do. So you can see this is a, a Wordle, if you have not seen a Wordle before. But essentially, we pull keywords from all the different projects we have. And the size of the letters works as how much that shows up. And some themes really start to pop up when you look at this. Right, right up top, you see the idea of data-driven. When we do this work, when we do this kind of research, we want to make sure we're not working in a vacuum that you're not out and you're saying, well, you know, this, is, this would be an interesting theoretical thing that you could never actually do. We are very interested in the practical. We're very interested in making sure what we do is data driven. What we do can be implemented, does have an impact. We're also very interested in performance, right? Performance metrics. How do you measure? How do you say, hey, you know, if you do something, if you go out there, if we do a project, when you're looking at mega regions, how do you say what your impact has? And that's gonna be very important. You need to know so, you know, what, should we keep going down this path? Do we need to change the path? Is there something else we should be looking at? The only way really to know that is if you're able to evaluate, if you're able to come back and say, what are performance metrics? You know, obviously safety is a major issue, the state of good repair. State of good repair, when you look at state of good repair in the context of the FHW guide, it's, it's, it's pavement, but it's also your congestion, it's, your, it's some of your operational measures fall in there. Management, freight, transit, we bring each of the different pieces in. You know, congestion, economic impact, infrastructure. So this really, I think, gives a nice overview of what you see when you get a cross-section when you start pulling these university centers together, because you can bring a lot of different folks from a lot of different departments across campuses and across schools. And we're very excited about the work we're doing. We're very excited about the work uh, Catherine is, is with Mega Regions and working with Catherine and, and promoting and advancing these activities. But there's also a listing of, of a number of our key projects. As you can see, there's, the main theme would be safety, and then it would tie in with economic competitiveness or state of good repair. We have a number of economic competitors. This is where you, you, you tend to see the main themed projects of freight movement, port facilities, uh, economic development, workforce impacts, uh, business location, growth projects. So there's a number of projects. And then state of good repair. We have some, some very exciting research on uh, you know, it, feasibility studies, way in motion systems, reducing interruptions in linear infrastructure, right? Your infrastructure has to work and it has to work reliably. How do you, how do you reduce those impacts? So we have a lot of different projects and a lot of different work that we're very excited about. There's a no, number of initiatives. We have this, these workshops, conferences. Uh, there is a annual conference we hold that it's held each spring where all the different centers, and actually all the UTCs in the Southeast region will participate. Then uh, we have the research, uh, the TRB, we're all very involved in the TRB, the international sides. As I said, we have education. And this is actually one, one of the things I really enjoy. I enjoy the, the outreach part. And, and working with the high school and the elementary school students and trying to get them involved and interested. As, as a university professor, I'll say it's very rare to have a freshman walk in and say, I want to do transportation, right? I mean, how many of you actually said that your freshman year? You went into mechanical or you went into something else. Fantastic. All right. We, we are, civil engineering itself and transportation is essentially a receiver unit, right? What that means, I think, Catherine, you've probably heard this a number of times is if you look at some of the other colleges, they have large freshman classes and students transfer out. When you look at transportation in civil, you have a number of students who, they started somewhere else and they transfer in because when they came in, they've never heard the term mega regions when they were in high school. They've heard about bridges and they've heard about building a car, but they've never seen, they have no idea what we do. They, they, they know they drive through traffic signals, but they haven't got the slightest clue that somebody actually designs those things in some way, shape or form. And, Sometimes driving through them, I don't know that we do, but you know, it, it's, it's great. And so we kind of get out there and we can reach out. So we've been doing a number of activities, you know, to, to just this summer we're looking at, uh, we had, this would be seventh and eighth graders. We did some camps and they came in and you, you, we, we drew them in on the tablets, right? They had iPads and their, and their goal was to write a game. And they love it. They, they sign up. There's a particular piece of software called Game Salad and it's all a visual interface. They don't actually write script. It's all done, done visually. And, but that we have them focus their game about transportation problems. And some of them, there was some really interesting uh, freight. You know, they were, they were having the freight and the trains trying to move and organize how the port might work. Now, part of their game was the ships would crash, but you know, still, I mean, it's, it's, it's their game. Uh, you have Lego robotics and transportation. There was a transportation group say, look at the Lego and, and come in and say, well, let's tackle some transportation on this. So we would bring that theme into the piece to introduce them. So we really enjoyed this. Uh, Camp Connect was, was an organization down at UCF which was running some similar camps and another other pieces. So that's, that's our center in a nutshell. We're very excited about it. Certainly if you wish to 
know any more about it, please contact me. We're very excited about the mega region work and our participation there. So we'll jump right into our next step, which is going to be our panel. Our first speaker today will be David Lee. Uh, Dr. David Lee. Uh, David manages several projects deeply involved with mega regions, the architecture of mega regions, bringing freight components into statewide and regional transportation travel demand and forecasting, uh, freight movement and port facilities and economic competitiveness. Uh, David works are currently with uh, Catherine's group. We are very happy to have David at Georgia Tech as well as have David at this uh, conference. Previously was with the Georgia, I'm sorry, the George Washington Regional Commission and the Fredericksburg Area Metropolitan Transportation Organization. He received his PhD in city and regional planning from Iowa State University. Ohio. Oh, I'm sorry, Ohio. Look at that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna was that a promotion or, or demotion? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure how that works. But we got you to Georgia Tech eventually, and that's really what counts right there. Uh, and also his master's degree from the State University of New York in Buffalo, and his bachelor's from Hanyang University in Seoul. David? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the second session. Um, uh, connected places, like when you connect the places, I think uh, we are talking about goods, but uh, connecting goods, uh, it involves people like me. I, I 20 years ago uh, in my uh, uh, younger days in military, in, in Korean army, I was thinking, uh, what, what should I do in 20 years? You know, I, I, I never imagined I'm sitting, uh, standing in the metro Atlanta you know, the uh, chamber and presenting, talking about the mega region. So this is globalization and this is connecting goods through the people. So I'm here uh, to talk about a little bit uh, what we do at the uh, CQGLD. My name is David Lee, a research scientist at Georgia Tech. I joined this team uh, about two years ago and my glasses, my lens uh, became like mega region. When I look at the data, when I look at the profiles of some uh, uh, regional information, I, you know, look through, is it really uh, helping our mega region, you know, the economically, uh, politically, do they have some kind of consensus, things like that. So uh, we are talking about mega region, connected places, and freight. So changes, uh, changes in the trading networks are having significant effect on the future of a metro uh, regions um, as a pattern of linkages shift the relationship of a mega region to the global and North American networks is also changing. It is uh, increasingly important for mega regions to uh, develop strategies to remain well connected and competitive within uh, this emerging network. So although uh, the circumstances and uh, approaches and systems are totally different in different parts of the world, uh, um, are, they are all struggling uh, in order to tackle down uh, these common issues, global common issues related to uh, uh, mega region level planning. Uh, those are uh, preparing for global economic comp competition and emphasis on polycentricity and climate change and uh, uh, rapid growth population and connectivity, congestion, importance of ports, and management of natural resources. This map shows world shipping trade. Um, the worldwide fleet of about 90,000 ships transport 90% uh, of the world's commodities. Isn't it amazing? Uh, see the magnitude between North America and Asia, and also uh, North America and Europe, and Europe and Asia. This slide shows uh, the top 50 world container ports. The port of Shanghai, the top, number one, once again became the busiest container port in the world in 2012. And followed by the Singapore, Hong Kong, and Shenzhen, and Busan. Top five um, is all in Asia. So Asian ports continue to dominate. Where we are here, uh, Los Angeles ranked 16, Long Beach 23rd, New York, uh, New Jersey 25th, and Georgia Ports 44th. 
This map uh, shows U.S. national uh, gateways by mode and mega regions. Each mega region has its own gateways for different modes and uh, actively utilize those gateways in order to exchange capital, goods, and services across the international borders and territories. Uh, industrialization, advances in technology and transportation, and globalization, multinational corporations, and outsourcing are all having a major impact on the international trade system. So let's take a look at uh, how well mega regions perform in international trade. As for import, uh, California mega region takes the top in terms of a value, while Texas Triangle mega region imports largest amount of goods tonnage wise. As for export, second, uh, uh, second column, uh, Northeast mega region takes the top with uh, nearly 18% and the top exporter in terms of volume was also Texas Triangle. Mega regions are so important because they cover most of the American international trade by uh, 82 to 87 of total value wise and then 75 to 78% of total volume wise. Piedmont Atlantic is actually doing a good job now, but we can do better and we will. This slide shows how important our economy is to other economies at mega region level. Two mega regions are selected uh, in this slide as an example to show uh, some ca comparison. Piedmont Atlantic on top and uh, Texas Triangle at the bottom. Piedmont Atlantic mega region uh, imported goods through Savannah, Georgia, coming through water uh, mostly from East Asia, covers 35% uh, and rest of America 31% and Europe 14% are being consumed at Piedmont Atlantic by nearly 40% in value and also distributed to other mega regions, partnering mega regions, which are Texas Triangle 25%, Midwest 8%, Florida 8%, Northeast 8%. Although Texas Triangle mega region is a good trading partner to Piedmont Atlantic for import through Savannah Port, exporting activity side of it is rather limited. You see here, the other, the other column for the export, uh, I didn't highlight it. That, uh, Texas Triangle mega region imports good uh, through Houston, Texas, coming through water mostly from rest of Americas, Europe, and Southwest and Central Asia, are being consumed at Texas Triangle by 22% in value and also distributed to other mega regions, uh, such as Northeast, California, Midwest, Central Plain. In this comparison, uh, it seems that Texas Triangle is overall engaging other uh, adjacent mega regions for international trade uh, as a trading partners more than uh, Piedmont Atlantic does. In fact, it is interesting to see the trade uh, through Houston port is very limited to uh, Piedmont Atlantic. So we, we should do a better job uh, engaging other uh, partnering mega regions. This is example. I chose uh, this crude petroleum as an example commodity to show uh, what's going on. Uh, as you see the table at the bottom, Top uh, 10 commodity covers 77% uh, out of total importing value, and single most important uh, commodity importing com commodity is crude petroleum. That's why I chose this to show, which covers almost 40% uh, of total imports by volume. Importing sources uh, for crude petroleum are diversified from Africa, Southwest, and Central Asia. Canada, and rest of Americas and Mexico. You see from Canada, and it hits, uh, uh, in term, if you see with the glass of mega region perspective, it's, uh, it hits mostly the Midwest mega region and Northeast. And this one is from Southwest and Central Asia, hit the uh, uh, Texas Triangle and Louisiana states mostly. And 
is coming from Africa, also similar. Um, so what I'm saying here in last map, compare with other maps, this is uh, the distribution of the pipelines. So infrastructure, right? It overlays well with the distribution pattern. So spatial distribu pa uh, distribution patterns of crude petroleum are primarily uh, directed to major refineries, which seem to be heavily focused on four mega regions, which is Midwest, Texas Triangle, and Central Plains and Northeast. The distribution patterns of crude petroleum depending on the structure of pipelines for distribution infrastructure and locations of refineries, producers of product, and locations of logistics hub for transportation, the structure of the refined product pipelines, suppliers, and locations of consumer market for consumption. So what I'm saying here in this map when policy and business strategies are developed cooperatively among stakeholders within partnering uh, mega regions, outcomes could be mutually beneficial and cost effective. Different goods are coming into different mega regions. As you see, Texas Triangle and Piedmont Atlantic show different top 10 import and export commodities. With one of our ongoing UTC projects, we are trying to understand where these commodities are going uh, domestically and connected to local economy. Each mega region has its own regional advantages which uh, shape regional economies. So connecting these commodities to the regional economy. The table shows location quotient of each sector, industry sector at um, mega region level. Location quotient is a valuable way of quantifying how concentrated a particular industry, cluster, occupation, or uh, demographic group is in a region as compared to the nation. So it can reveal what makes a particular region unique in comparison to the national average. So as you see, Texas Triangle Mega Region shows highest regional strength at the industries uh, such as mining, quarrying, and oil, and ga gas extraction, with a location quotient of 4.18, which is really high. And Piedmont Atlantic has regional strength at manufacturing with 1.3 something, and administrative and waste services, and transportation and warehousing. So, uh, how and which industry sectors we put our uh, emphasis on will determine regional economy. It will det uh, determine our future. And the commodities coming in and going out from each mega region will be different accordingly. So smart visionary policy decisions on industry clustering will reshape the future uh, regional economy and improve economic competitiveness. In order to connect those regional uh, industry clustering and commodity movement more efficiently, transportation infrastructure, that becomes a top priority. Each mega region should prioritize which core cities and peripheral places need to be connected first in order to maximize their regional economic benefits. This is just an example to show the list of top 10 freight linkages within Piedmont Atlantic mega region in, uh, yeah. And number one on top, you see the linkages between Atlanta and Charlotte. And number two, Atlanta and Birmingham. Number three, Atlanta and Nashville. As a part of the project, the architecture of the mega region funded by Federal Highway, thank you. And we did a, a national survey targeting uh, state DOTs and MPOs in 2013. And here's a question related to needed infrastructure requiring mega region approach. About 40% of respondents pointed out the importance of a freight. We are currently conducting two uh, freight related UTC project funded by Federal Highway and Georgia Department of Transportation. Thank you both. And I think it covers my salary, right? <laughs> yeah. The, the first one is uh, freight movement, port facilities, and economic competitiveness. 
uh, we are utilizing uh, real-time GPS truck data uh, for this project. Uh, Atri representative is here. Thank you very much. Uh, with this project, we are trying to reveal the relationship between the Panama Canal expansion and port activities along the eastern seaboard and also uh, trying to uh, present the relationship between expected changes in freight movements from the port to the destination. The project will measure how new freight movements will impact on major uh, freight corridors and local and regional economies. This is a second project uh, built, uh, bringing fre uh, freight components into regional travel demand forecasting, which is more focused on regional level, metro level. Uh, we are trying to develop GPS-based and tour truck model for Atlanta and Birmingham uh, metro area at uh, Piedmont Atlantic Mega Region with the detailed employ employment data and regional transportation network. And with this project, we are trying to build a standardized transferable prototype of a freight uh, forecasting modeling methodology and freight data architecture that other DOTs and MPOs uh, can uh, 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 learn from. Uh, we are in the process of uh, building the architecture of the mega region funded by Federal Highway. Uh, this diagram shows four major components that we propose in uh, building plans at the mega region level, geography, governance, and implementation, funding, and financing. Our next step is taking this conceptual diagram to implementation. As a conclusion, uh, following this architecture, um, freight analysis and plan development should be taken at a national at, and or mega region level rather than single uh, MPO or county level. Each uh, commodity has its own supply chain that uniquely characterize its spatial distribution patterns. In order to improve mega region's economic competitiveness, uh, further study is recommended for each commodity and its uh, related industries and supply chains at uh, mega region level. It is also recommended that further analysis for each commodity category are needed to investigate linkages between mega region planning and regional planning, uh, regional economic competitiveness, considering all gaps and opportunity with uh, specific freight activities connecting each commodity supply chains. I will close my presentation with a poem that I made when I started the mega region study. So Atlanta, chin up and look up the sky. Do you want to grow bigger and glow brighter? Do you want to hooray for economic prosperity? Do you want to be a bigger giant than New England? Do you want to compete with Chicago and Midwest? Uh, do you want to be an ultimate global champion? Then go and reach out to Greenville, Charlotte, Greensboro, Raleigh, go and embrace August, uh, Augusta, Columbia, Fayetteville. Go and attract Chattanooga, Knoxville, Johnson City. Go and ally with Nashville, Huntsville, Birmingham, Montgomery. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. I believe we'll do qu all questions at the end? Yes. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Frederick Duca. Uh, Dr. Duke is from the National Center for Smart Growth, University of Maryland. Uh, Frederick has more than 30 years experience in travel forecasting. He currently manages the Transportation Policy Research Group at the NCSG and supervises projects for the Maryland State Highway Administration and the Maryland Department of Transportation and has managed a project for FHWA to analyze the Chesapeake mega region. Uh, Frederick has his BS in mathematics from St. Peter's College. The, program, I apologize, it actually says Georgia Tech. That is our loss. Frederick was at St. Peter's College. And also a MBA from the Wharton School and a PhD from City Planning in the University of Pennsylvania. Frederick, thank you. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge this was funded by Federal Highway Administration Exploratory Advanced Research Program. The purpose of this was to see if we could build a travel forecasting model at the mega region level using available data and available tools. And we successfully did that. And it was also to look at, see if we could look at mega region issues with this tool. And we have, I'll show you that we've looked at freight. And 
one of the things I would say is that, you know, one of our conclusions out of this study, and I'll be leading up to this, is that in order to understand freight movements and in order to understand mega regions, you have to think beyond traditional MPO and state, state DOT political boundaries, that they, they form a different region. This is the Chesapeake mega region, okay? It stems from Wilmington up here down to Norfolk, Virginia Beach. How we define this is uh, the purple area that you see was an area originally defined by Catherine Ross. Uh, we had a statewide model for Maryland, which we expanded, and that's the pink area overlaid on what uh, Catherine did. And then finally, we did added some orange areas just to even things out. The defining issue here is the Chesapeake Bay, okay? And there's a lot of regional identity with the Chesapeake Bay. Um, now, one of the things about mega regions that we found is that the issue that you're analyzing in part determines the mega region and the mega region boundaries. We chose to analyze the economy, which is this area. Well, the health of the bay is also of consideration. And so were we to choose to analyze the health of the bay, we would have to extend this analysis area to covering central Pennsylvania and southern New York, covering the entire Bay watershed. And in fact, uh, not fund I have to be clear on this, this is not funded by Federal Highway, but there's a huge number of chicken farms in this area and up in this area, and so that runoff from chicken manure into the Chesapeake Bay is a major issue in this area. And we're starting to look at that uh, on a project funded by the totally different group. All right, uh, the infrastructure of the mega region. Here's the bay. This mega region is largely, largely defined by the I-95 and I-64 corridor. There's development all along this corridor, okay? This region has three major ports, uh, Wilmington, Baltimore, and Nor Norfolk, Virginia Beach. Um, has three major airports in Baltimore, and one in Baltimore, two in Washington. Major railroads, Chessie System, Norfolk Southern, and Amtrak. Uh, the Am uh, major carriers from Amtrak from Washington, D.C., northward, um, and 13, mile, 13 miles of roadway. Okay, so, so some basic statistics for the mega region. Um, population of 15 million, employment of, of 9 million, all right, 124 counties, and the GDP is 6% of the U.S. GDP, so it is a significant part of, of, the major, of the regional economy, and we have the major ports, okay? Now, just these major ports, somebody had mentioned yesterday about ports that they don't necessarily compete with each other. We found that uh, in our study. Norfolk tends to be uh, a regional port, uh, a national port, bringing in goods that get shipped out all over the country. Baltimore tends to be more of a regional port, looking at stuff to ship, say, less than 400 miles, pretty much. And Wilmington brings in a lot, oh, it should be Wilmington, Delaware, not Wilmington, Nebraska. But uh, uh, Wilmington brings in um, uh, a lot of oil and ships out, like, through oil pipelines. So these ports really don't compete with each other. Okay. But what I want to talk about is the intermega region linkages, and I'll be focusing in on the freight. But let me start with the commuter flows. As you can see, there's commuter, these are the commuter flows from the ACS. Uh, these are the flows around Wilmington, around the Baltimore-Washington area, which is one massive sprawl, Something around, some around Richmond, and some around Norfolk, Virginia Beach. Okay, so these commuter flows roughly break down in, into along the lines of the MPOs, okay? But I also want to talk about freight flows, and that gives us a different picture. So for freight flows, and these are intra-mega regional freight flows, so these are flows within the region. We did analyze national flows into the region, but these are flows that are internal within the region. All right, and we got data from uh, a firm called Implan, and this data has on inter-county dollar flows. So what this does is for each county, it divides up the economy into 440 sectors, and it looks at the flow between each sector in that county to every other sector in, in every other county. So between a county pair, there's 440 squared flows. So from Montgomery County, Maryland, 
to Fairfax County, Virginia might have computer parts that are shipped to a computer retailer. So you have one, one economic sector shipping, another economic sector receiving. And that goes for these 440 flows by 127 counties. So you get a huge number of flows, 440 times 440 times 127. It's a massive amount of data. So what we did with that is we applied a model called Hall Choice. And that, the Hall Choice model converts dollar flow, okay, to, in using Hall Choice, we converted the dollar flow to dollar by truck flows, okay? So what we had to do is first start out which financial flows include physical movement, okay? Because this has all financial flows. So it could have one bank sending money to another bank, which would have a very large financial flow, but no physical movement. So we can first convert it into physical movement. Then we use some algorithms involving distance and cost to determine which of that physical movement went by truck, which went by rail, which might go by another mode. And there are other factors in there. I won't go into the details of fall choice. But anyway, that converted dollar flows into physical movement. And then we took a look at, well, what does this look on a mega region basis? And these are the flows. You know, the thicker the flow, the larger the, the amount. But these are the freight flows by truck, but it's by dollar value. So the thicker that line, the higher the dollar value you see. But what you can see is that through the mega region, there's a very large, there's a, a lot of tight linkages. And particularly if like from Wilmington and Baltimore down to Washington, down to Richmond, and all of those go down to Hampton Roads, Norfolk, Virginia Beach area. So heavy dollar freight flow by truck. And what, you, what is apparent is that the freight flows, number one, are knitting the mega region together. And number two, they go beyond what's in the traditional, uh, the smaller MPO area. In the first slide you saw the commuter flows are tied into the MPOs, but the freight flows are not. OK, so we looked at the highway freight flows in dollars out of Baltimore. Okay. So you can see now Baltimore, the blue is Baltimore, Baltimore City, and right above here, the darker area, there's a Baltimore City and Baltimore County, so not to confuse those. But the dollar flows out of Baltimore, primarily to Baltimore County, but also go into the DC area, go into, um, into Delaware, Wilmington, and so forth, and down to Richmond. Okay. So these are the dollar flows from Baltimore. Okay. Now, Let's also look at the dollar flows into Baltimore. And here we see a different pattern. Okay. There's from all along the, the Delaware, from down here, from the uh, eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay, down even on the I-81 corridor. Uh, so dollar flows into Baltimore are coming from across the entire region and from Richmond and Hampton Roads and so forth. So what you see also is the dollar flow into Baltimore appears to be greater than the dollar flow out of Baltimore, which may be reasonable. I mean, this could be food, this could be consumables, and what comes out of Baltimore might be information processing or software or whatever. So just because the dollar flow into it is different from the dollar flow out, okay, indicate, can, in, can be an indicator of the type of economy in Baltimore. Okay. Now let me also go looking at highway freight flows in dollars out of Richmond, okay? So here, okay, now Richmond is shipping up to Washington, D.C., uh, up into Western Maryland, Baltimore, and so forth, okay? Now, one of the key points to note is, and these are truck shipments, and this is by dollar value that you see at the destination, okay? One of the interesting things to note is that this all goes up 95 or down I-64, okay? So this is, we're showing what goes out of Richmond at this point. But the next slide shows what goes into Richmond. And some of that comes from the immediate surrounding area, and some of that comes from up in the north, like Baltimore and Washington area. These are the dollar values going into Richmond. Now, if, you, if taking a look, remembering the previous slide, looks like the dollar value going out of Richmond is higher than the dollar value coming into Richmond. Okay. 
what we did not have the money to uh, analyze this, but what that would indicate is that what Richmond processes a lot of the goods that come in and then adds value to them by that processing and then ships them out again. And the second point is, again, Route 95 and Route 64 are critical to being able to make those, make those linkages. Okay. It kind of points to the fact that if, if part of the economy up here is dependent on being able to receive a shipment from Richmond, then we better make sure that I-95 is clear, okay, or that, that I-95 is a viable route, okay. And this is at the mega region level, okay. All right. And finally, uh, dollar, dollar flows into Richmond, okay. So anyway, and Richmond likely does processing of these things before it ships them out. All right. Now we want to do a supply chain analysis and uh, I want to credit Tim Welch of Georgia Tech, who was working at the University of Maryland at this time, who did a lot previously. of this previously. Yeah, previously at the University of Maryland. So we look at highway shipments into Richmond, and the, we looked at the uh, seven counties with the largest flows into Richmond. And these, by the way, these flows are by tonnage, not by dollar. Okay. All right. Okay. And then we look at, so there's processing going on in Richmond. This, in turn, is shipped out to Baltimore. And then we looked at this, what is shipped out of Baltimore into surrounding areas. And we looked at what Richmond is shipping out, is, is shipping. And we said about 30, about 40 percent of it is paper products. And then 10 percent, roughly, is aluminum manufacturing products. So very heavily onto these areas. And then Baltimore can, in turn, ship out like finished paper products, uh, manufactured, uh, manufactured products, and so forth. So there is a supply chain here. Now this is, we've done this, we would like to do a more sophisticated analysis of the supply chain, but this is, starts to point out that there's like these three-way linkages of one county shipping, county processing, shipping to a third county, and for the final processing. And this is, by the way, is different then the, su the supply chains that uh, we talked about yesterday were critical, but this is a different approach to it. Supply chains that they talked about were simply taking goods and how do you move them to the final dis distributor. What we're talking about in this supply chain is how do you take one type of product, manufacture it or convert it into another product, and then ship it again, and then finally con convert it into consumer goods. Okay. We did an economic analysis. And we used a, an input-output model that was in, b embedded in implant. And we said, if Richmond generates a 1% change in production, okay, what is the impact on selected counties of that 1% change? And this is an across-the-board change in production. And these, this indicates the size of the circle indicates the magnitude of the impact. And the 1% change in production here is uh, obviously a very big impact on the adjacent county to Richmond, but then the next impact goes up here in Loudoun County, which is a suburb of D.C. Okay. So then Washington and Baltimore, uh, Nelson County out here. Uh, so what it shows is that through the economy, this whole mega region is tied together, okay. and these are economic ties. All right. The second one is did this, this is the same analysis, but in this time, what we did is all the circles are the same size, but we tell what portions of the economy were impacted. So Richmond's 1% has a large impact on production up here in Frederick, Maryland, Washington County, a large impact in Baltimore on manufacturing, or here down in Newport on manufacturing, whereas that same 1% increase might, in Loudoun County, might impact services. Okay. But all of these, it's critical that this 95-64 corridor meet, needs to support that. Okay. So this is the economic analysis of these ties. All right, now what I want to do is one final slide, which is a trend to 2030. Well, I didn't talk about it. We built a travel forecasting model for this mega region, and we looked at what's the traffic going to be like in 2030. Okay. What's the traffic going to be like in 2030? 
Okay, so this is what it's going to be like. And I, I didn't go into the model deliberately. That would have taken hours. Um, but this is I-95 and the movement from uh, Wilmington down to Richmond, down to Norfolk, Virginia Beach. And this is where you see the heavy congestion. The gold indicates volume capacity ratios of one to two, which anybody who knows the travel modeling knows you can never achieve those volume to capacity ratios on the ground, but it does mean you get extensive delays. Okay. And then the red indicates volume capacity ratios greater than two, okay. which again are huge. Right. Now, what this is telling us though is Previously, I went through the whole thing of how this whole mega region is linked together and the economy is linked together. This is telling us that if we don't do something about this congestion here, okay, the ability of Richmond to make those exports and the imports is going to be threatened. Okay. So the conclusion here is that the mega region economy is really tied together, and you have to look for freight in the economy. You have to look at it at the mega region scale or even larger. The conclusions are the mega regions are tied together by economic interactions, by commodity flows, and by traffic flows. And the commute trips, you know, while we didn't um, go into detail on the commute trips, the commute trips, especially in the DC area within this mega region, really affect the ability of the whole mega region to function. So, and they also have their own identity. Um, there is a lot of, living in the D.C. area, there is a lot of identity, identity with the Chesapeake Bay and the Chesapeake mega region and so forth throughout that area. And the environment. Okay. So, as I said, the environment, well, we do, I mentioned our chicken manure project, but the environment is a critical issue for the Bay and there is concern about it within the region. Okay, but mega regions are not defined by state boundaries. They transcend those. And they're not necessarily defined by MPO boundaries. But they are critical for the MPOs to be, in my opinion, the critical for the MPO to be aware of and to plan with the, with the mega regional approach in mind. Same for the states. OK. And the other conclusion is the mega region view is necessary for understanding the economy. Okay. Fully understanding the freight requires a larger view than the MPO. Uh, to fully also understand the mega region linkages, we need data at the county or lower level to understand these intra-mega region flows. We have really great data from the FAF and several other sources, and we wouldn't criticize the FAF, it's, it's a great resource, but we have eight FAF zones within our mega region, and we have 127 counties within the mega region. So to really understand the internal flows, you need something large, with more detail than the FAF. And finally, improvements in infrastructure are critical for freight movements. You know, one of the things we're showing is that these movements up and down the corridor um, are critical for all the states in the corridor, but sometimes it can be hard to convince one state that, you know, they're really dependent on actions by another state in order to support their economy. So with that, I thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elisa Arias. She's managed multimodal transportation products for the U.S.-Mexico uh, border studies planning uh, prior to joining uh, the San Diego Association of Governments. She worked for the San Mateo County Transit District and the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. Born in Argentina, she received a bachelor's degree from the University of Buenos Aires and a master's in economics from San Francisco University. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Yesterday, I gave you a quick preview of the case study I'm going to present today. And um, he here again, we are at the Otaimesa uh, border crossing, uh, one of the key border crossings between California and Mexico. Um, here you can see the long lines of trucks lining up in Mexico, waiting to cross into the U.S. to be inspected. And Border crossings are really important for the economy of the California mega region. 
Uh, Mexico is California's number one export market, and mainly California exports um, transportation equipment and computers to Mexico. So let me start with um, a little view of the different ports of entry that connect uh, the California mega region with Mexico. So San Isidro is the busiest passenger crossing, both for vehicles, passenger vehicles and pedestrians. About 50,000 passenger vehicles cross between San Diego and Tijuana every day, and about 25,000 pedestrians. And uh, this port of entry handles about the same number of people as Los Angeles International Airport on an annual basis. Moving about six miles east is the Otaimesa border crossing I just described, about $35 billion worth of goods moving through that border crossing every year and 1.5 million trucks. And this port of entry also has a passenger component to it. Otaimesa East is a case study I'm going to be talking about. This is a collab collaborative pro project that we're working with our Mexican counterparts to build a new border crossing about two miles east of the largest uh, California-Mexico crossing. This is an innovative project that uh, just broke ground, actually, uh, in the last month. And it's a cross-border facility that will be sited in the U.S. south of the border, and there will be a bridge connecting to the Tijuana International Airport. So this is a pedestrian-only crossing for ticketed passengers, and there will be a toll component to it uh, to be able to use that facility. And this is a, a completely private sector-led project. Uh, the Tecate Port of Entry is a small crossing. Um, this is a, a fairly rural area connected to the rest of the highway system by a, 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 through a fairly um, narrow and winding road. It handles only about 5% of the trade between uh, California and Mexico. And then moving to Imperial County, to the east of San Diego, the Calexico West Passenger Crossing is a, a passenger and pe pedestrian crossing only, the largest uh, in Imperial County. And then the Calexico East Crossing is a commercial crossing, but it also handles passengers. And then similar to Tecade, Andrade is a fairly small multi-purpose crossing. So this is kind of the picture of the border crossings between California and Mexico. So as we embark in planning for a new border crossing, um, we need to really think of this as a binational system. Improvements to one border crossing obviously are going to affect the productivity and throughput of, an, of other border crossings. There's a lot of sensitivity to wait times because that is a, a constant. If you turn on the radio in San Diego in the morning, what you hear in addition to Interstate 5 or how traffic is moving, you hear about the waits at the border. So this is something that is ever present in, in our region. So one way, one tool that we have to look at the, at the border system is a, um, a, a project that was sponsored by the U.S.-Mexico Joint Working Committee, which is led by Federal Health Administration, USDOT, and the counterparts in Mexico, the Secretary of Communication and Transportation. And basically, this is a collaborative, um, voluntary process where federal agencies, state agencies, regional and, and local agencies on both sides of the border along the California-Mexico border got together and developed this plan that basically inventoried all the uh, needs both at the border crossings and the connecting transportation facilities and uh, came up with a binational evaluation criteria system that ranked all the projects in the U.S. and Mexico to come up with border-wide priorities with the hope of aligning priorities and vision, also taking into account changes in federal administrations in both countries and how this could be used as a, as a blueprint for border infrastructure investments. So going back to our favorite photo of the trucks lining up in Mexico to cross into the U.S., uh, you can see there's definitely insufficient capacity. Um, the port of entry on the U.S. side has very, li very limited room for expansion. There's no room for expansion on the Mexican side of the border. Uh, lines are always long, but they are unpredictable. And cars can wait anywhere from two to three hours, 
unless you have a sentry pass similar to the Nexus pass in, in Canada, which is a bit pre a preclearance process, and trucks can wait anywhere from one to six hours. And what we heard yesterday all day was reliability, consistency. This is not what this border crossing offers today. And as I mentioned yesterday also, uh, there's suppressed economic activity that impacts um, the economy of both countries and the California mega region, both in terms of output, wages, jobs, and of course there are environmental impacts related to all these weights. These are vehicles that are idling as they're waiting to cross the border. Uh, we expect the mega region to continue to grow, and here we can talk about the California mega region or the binational mega region really and uh, insufficient uh, public funds to build new transportation and border crossing infrastructure. Border crossings are a failed responsibility, however, the funding for border crossings continues, continues to shrink. And why is it important to, to plan for land uh, crossings? Well, you can see here, this is US-Mexico data, and two-thirds of the, of the cargo moves by truck. If you look at the statistics between California and Mexico, this is over 90% of the goods moved by truck. And why is it important locally to, to Sandag as an MPO? Well, local trade with Mexico continues to outpace the growth in our uh, San Diego gross regional product. So trade with Mexico continues to grow faster than the San Diego gross regional product. And nationwide, basically trade means jobs. And here you can see uh, Mexico is the third largest uh, trading partner with the U.S. And if you look at exports and imports, they are fairly balanced, even though you know, the U.S. imports more from Mexico than it exports to Mexico, it's fairly balanced. And both Canada and, and Mexico um, are key trade partners for both imports and exports. And if you drill down a little bit more and you look at the content, the U.S. content in the imports from these countries, here you can see that the, the U.S. content of imports from Mexico is 40%, while from the other countries is much lower. So even though there's somewhat of an imbalance between imports and exports between the U.S. and Mexico, the U.S. content of the goods imported from Mexico is fairly high, 40%. Basically, SANDAC, uh, the Department of Transportation, Caltrans, and other agencies kind of got together to look at what could be done it, to improve the border transportation infrastructure and the attendant economic benefits. Basically, we're looking at the port of entry, the largest port of entry, as I mentioned, uh, handling about $35 billion worth of goods. This is about the same value of imports for the Savannah port. It's like if all, all, the, the, all the imports that come into the Savannah port had to wait two to six hours to clear the gate while the trucks are idling. That's kind of the comparison that I can make here in Atlanta. So, um, SANDAC worked to get a state legislation that would allow SANDAC to be a toll authority that would be able to toll the, the connecting road, State Route 11, that will connect to the new border crossing. And this is meant to be a public-public partnership. Those toll revenues could be used to um, basically leverage other resources or bonded uh, so we can build the port of entry ahead of the decades that it would take to wait for the federal funding to build this new border crossing. And we're hoping that this could be a new model also for other border transportation infrastructure for financing border crossings. This requires really unique partnership. As I mentioned, Sanda is a toll authority, but we're working in close partnership with agencies both in the U.S. And, and Mexico. On the U.S. side, all the federal agencies, uh, Department of Homeland Security, U.S. DOT, General Service Administration, and on the state side, the California Highway Patrol, working together on the land port of entry aspect. Sandag and Caltrans working together on the road component, State Route 11. And then Sandag taking the lead on the financial strategy and also the ITS system, basically looking at um, information on border wait times, uh, travel, advanced travel information, and a lot of coordination with Mexico because we can only build half of the project. We really need to get Mexico on board to build the other half at the same time. Um, so in terms of the border crossing in the U.S., it will be a 100 plus acre facility. It will have a commercial vehicle enforcement facility that will be used by the California Highway Patrol, and the connecting road is a two-mile road. 
In Mexico will be about a 90 plus acre border crossing, and they're also going to build uh, two roads, one for passenger vehicles and one for trucks. So here's the project in the US. Uh, the magenta line shows the first segment of State Route 11 that will go out of construction by the end of the year. Part of the funding for this project is coming from the bond measure I described yesterday, part of the $2 billion in freight um, investments that was voted uh, in California in 2008. And the segments two and three, is, which is a completion of State Route 11 and the border crossing facility itself, um, is targeted for 2017. Uh, in Mexico, um, the road shown in blue is the passenger vehicle access to the border crossing, and the longer road sh shown in magenta will be the truck access to the border crossing. In terms of funding, as I mentioned, this is an innovative type of financing that we're, we're looking into. There are some state, some federal, and some bonds uh, that are part of the project, but over 80% of the project will be financed through innovative financing. Um, as I mentioned over and over again, this requires a lot of partnerships, a lot of close coordination uh, with Mexico. As this is only half of the project in the US, so we really need to work together with Mexico. They are already, um, they already have environmental clearance for their, their project. Uh, at times, they're a little bit ahead of the US, and so we're hoping that this project will come to fruition at the same time. The policy challenges are um, basically many agencies with different missions. So for some agencies, safety is the main uh, goal. For other agencies, is security. For other agencies, is efficiency. And we're trying to find that nexus, that common ground uh, where we can really get a new border crossing that is efficient and safe. The unique aspects of the projects to, to summarize are basically the unique financing and partnering approach. This is a, a project that's being driven by a metropolitan plan organization, not by the federal government, even though we do have close partnership with the federal government. Uh, the idea is that it will be it pay for itself through tolls. As I mentioned, the legislation al allowed to, for this to be a public-public partnership, even though there's definitely room for the private sector. And again, a possible prototype a national pilot. So in terms of the, the leveraging the strength for, for this new approach, you can see that the public sector has a role in the systems view of the border, um, planning for the border crossing and addressing community issues, uh, looking at traffic flows, the entitlement process to build the border crossing, seeking some public funds, doing modeling, doing the financing side, but there's room for the private sector also to participate in this, in this project. Uh, this is a, we're breaking new ground. Basically, there's no template for this uh, public-private approach to border efficiency. We're do, we are following uh, some of the model of the Alameda Corridor uh, project in the Los Angeles Basin. And we brought in uh, financial and legal partners early in the process. And we'll continue to work with them as we find uh, the partnership with Mexico to close, to close that deal. And we do feel that it can, there can be a new path forward for border transportation infrastructure. Now, what are the challenges? Basically, um, NAFTA provided a lot of increasing trade. However, the transportation and border crossing infrastructure hasn't kept pace with that increased trade. So demand exists supply. You saw the border congestion, the environmental issues that it brings, also land use conflicts, um, the economic impacts that I described, increased security, and as I mentioned, many agencies at the local, regional, state, federal level, times two, because we're working with Mexico, managing the border crossings. So Sandak now is completing the ITS concept of operations, basically looking at a, a provision of border wait times and a vast traveler information system. We do have to finalize the joint vision with both the federal agencies in the US and counterparts in Mexico. We are finalizing also a traffic and revenue study that's going to tell us how to size the port of entry, what we can leverage to finance, and proceed with the nuts and bolts of the development of the project. So this concludes the presentation, and I'll be happy to answer questions with the panel. I'd like to thank all of our speakers again. Thank you. Now we have about 20 minutes, this is what we kind of plan for questions, so are there any questions from the audience? 
Ed, um, the question was on your study, you mentioned the FAF data set. Right. And, the yes. FAF, and, the, and the problem is the FAF does not have the granularity to do type of mega regions. Correct. Who really should be filling that role in providing that data gap between the federal data sets and the local data sets? Is that a federal responsibility? Is that a multi, I mean, who should be doing that gap of filling in the the, the data sets needed to do mega region studies? I, I, in my opinion, I think it's already being filled by the private sector, okay, because we got the implant data that, that we got was from the private sector, and that, that worked very well. And there's also a whole question of exactly what data do you need. In other words, we got data on dollar flows and converted that into travel. Um, if you wanted straight data on, on vehicle movements, that might be somebody else to do that. So it, it really depends on what, what the purpose is, too. On the um, Mexico crossing, are you looking into congestion pricing, uh, you know, different pricing by time of day to try to even the flow out a little bit? And also, are you going to be doing a, uh, a peer review of your traffic and revenue forecast? In terms of congestion pricing, yes. Uh, the idea is uh, to look at um, pricing by time of day and also sometimes segmenting maybe the, the, the truck traffic is possible, looking at different sensitivity of timing to cross. Basically, what the project is selling is somewhat uh, more reliability, and we say somewhat because we don't control the federal box, we control the access to the border crossing, and then working with the federal agencies to process the, the, the goods quickly, but we don't control as an MPO or as a state agency the federal inspection process. So we're basically selling the reliability of getting to the inspection process, and then after you leave, also heading into the, the highway system in a, in a quick fashion. But there's this black box in the middle that we, we don't necessarily control. Uh, and the second part of the question was on the TNR. Um, it's being conducted you know, by, um, with, with close coordination of our financial advisors, so I'm not sure that there will be a peer review process associated with it. Um, just in terms of, the, the nice thing about FAF is that it's, it's free and it's available to everyone. And you know, the private sector may be providing that, um, that data, but you gotta pay for it. And not, not all MPOs are, are able to you know, have, have that kind of money to spend because it can be pretty expensive. Um, so if there were someone that was gonna take advantage, you know, someone that would provide it, I mean, should that be a, a federal role? Is, you know? um, I mean, that's, I guess, a comment or a question. And the other one is for David. Um, with your uh, freight forecasting methodology, um, for your, your, your modeling methodology, um, this is for you, David. Yeah. Um, how close are you on, on finishing that? And have you been working with, uh, with our, our modeling staff <coughs> at uh, ARC with that? First of all, we didn't show you the whole study. I mean, the whole study said, how is this mega region linked to other mega regions? And then what are the internal linkages? And I only show the internal part. So we re heavily relied on the FAF to show the linkages to the rest of the country. And in building our travel model, we relied on the FAF to get the, the freight movements from the rest of the country. As far as the internal linkages goes, I think that if, if somebody has got to provide that so that you can get it for free, it should probably be the federal government and for, for the reason that it crosses state lines. I mean, we had every county linked to every other county. So every county in, in Maryland, all its linkages to Virginia and to Delaware. And I think it's going to be difficult to get a state to put that put up for that. So I think it should probably be a federal role. Um, we we collaborate with Arizona. Arizona is also a, actually they completed a, a border master plan. So we are in coordination with them, especially Imperial County, because of you know the the um, the proximity to Arizona. There's definitely coordination, and we are aware of each other each other's plans. And with Northern California, I would say that there isn't as much. A coordination in terms of the border crossings. Um, you mentioned that uh, for the new proposed border crossing that 80% uh, of um, 
the uh, capital expenditures would need innovative fi financing. Um, I was just wondering if um, what uh, funding strategies uh, you have explored that uh, might uh, help to make up for some of that shortfall. Uh, the, the main one is tolling, basically. Uh, the, the road, we cannot toll the border crossing per se, but we can toll the road. The Santa has authority to toll the road. And Mexico also will be tolling their facility. So uh, the revenues from the tolls at this point appear to be one of the uh, key financing mechanisms. That's something we're still working on with Mexico. Ideally, it would be a common toll, a single toll, so there are not two transactions that people have to deal with. So that's part of the, the conversation with Mexico about maybe a joint toll that then gets distributed to both countries. You mentioned the JWC as part of your presentation. Could you explain maybe to the group a little bit more about the JWC and how you possibly use that as a mechanism to coordinate with adjacent states in addition to our Mexican counterparts? Sure. So the, the Joint Working Committee is basically made that. It's, it's led by the Federal Health Administration as part of the US DOT, and it includes other um, federal agencies and counterpart agencies in Mexico. And the states, not the MPOs, the states have representation at the JWC, so basically we rely on Caltrans, the Department of Transportation, to uh, present the views of the MPOs. Now, uh, because Sanda has been working closely with the Department of Transportation on this new border crossing, we do tend to participate a little bit more than we used to before. And there's, there's a similar mechanism with the U.S.-Canadian border. It's a coordinating committee of the, of, the, of the same sort. And they are very interested in the planning aspects of the uh, border crossings. The U.S. Bridges and Border Crossings Committee deals more with, per, uh, not permitting, but um, reviewing border crossing projects. But the transportation infrastructure that serves those border crossings is more under the purview of the U.S.-Mexico Joint Working Committee. And this committee has some funding that they are able to give out to the states to do some of this border planning. Well, we definitely are aware of you know the data gaps, uh, commodity flows, uh, origin destination. Uh, we are able to do origin destination service at the border and ask truckers where they're going, and they know the first stop, but they don't, they're not necessarily aware of the final destination of the goods because they get transloaded. We also don't necessarily know all the information about the goods that are being uh, carried uh, in those trucks. Um, also, it'll be interesting to know some of the uh, to address some of the inefficiencies of trucks moving empty south of, uh, to south of the border. So they bring loads to the U.S. and then they move back empty to Mexico. That happens a lot. It will be very interesting to be able to know more about the, the goods and how to coordinate um, the trucking practices so they're more efficient in terms of being loaded uh, more often crossing south into Mexico. Two, two comments. One is if I'm looking at competitiveness, I need to know who else is doing what. So if I'm the Chesapeake mega region, I need to know what other mega regions are trying to produce the similar goods, which calls for a, a larger approach. But in terms of just looking at the study that we did, you know, it's one thing to talk about economic competitiveness, which is important. But when I look at the growing congestion along I-95, one of the th issues we have is how do I keep things from getting worse? In other words, the, a lot of the focus has been on, well, that person might get ahead of me. And if, you know, and this, the reverse of that is, well, I can't even stay even. I'm falling behind. That person will get ahead because I'm falling behind, not because they're improving. So we have to, I think, one of the first things is to hold what you have before we look at where we advance. Uh, one, one comment, I think uh, it is important to linking uh, the distribution, special distribution of industries for each region. Uh, we know the uh, freight uh, flow, freight movement, even though the FAP data shows the, you know, uh, uh, a bigger level, but uh, still we can see the movement tonnage-wise and value-wise, certain point. But uh, we also have a separate data set for the industry clustering. So if we can link those together, and a final level, it will be very important because, you know, as I showed you 
in the slide, we know what kind of goods are coming to the Savannah port and going where, briefly. But uh, we don't really take a look at with the magnifying, you know, what is the uh, industry related to those goods in our region. So the industry, the automobile brings lots of uh, different companies all together as a package. So we, if we uh, analyze th those relationships for each industry in uh, more detail, then uh, that, that will be very helpful. That's my thought. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I do have one I would like to ask. If that's okay with uh, watch some of this. Uh, one of the things I often hear that's harder than a public private partnership is a public public partnership. And you're dealing with various states, various counties, cities. I mean, everybody in the public's involved. And I'm sure if you had a magic wand, what would you see as the infrastructure, the governmental infrastructure or policy infrastructure for these mega regions? Are the pieces already already there? Is it working great, or is it something like a, a mega region MPO, or is it ashto type of club one for the region? I mean, I'm just curious what you would see as a good way to help manage that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. You know, the the MPO governance lends itself, you know, to advancing um, these issues that much. Uh, it, it is a collaborative approach. And we, as MPOs, have mandates that we have to comply with, and this is not one of them. So this is a little bit of the volunteer work that we all do in the, uh, at the MPO level. But we're good at collaboration. We know how to do that. So we um, you know, are able to accomplish some things through collaboration with our partners, our neighbors. Uh, our the, the architecture of the mega region report had some section uh, showing uh, the different typology for the governance and then funding and financing and that report is not released yet but it's coming and uh, that includes our proposal and I think uh, the border between uh, uh, US and Mexico case is more like a voluntary uh, cooperation but uh, we are uh, drawing some different uh, typology that yeah. I personally feel some sort of a Super MPO would be required. Uh, some, some some governmental structure at that point, and uh, I think it's going to be easier in the South and the West than it is in the Northeast. The the older New England states and uh, uh, Mid Atlantic states have far more local jurisdictions and minor civil divisions than than say out in, in the western part of the country. So it's also going to be area area specific within the United States. I guess I sort of would like to ask a corollary to that question, and I almost hate to do this because it's going the other direction. Uh, but that has to do with the role of uh, cities, especially central cities. Uh, obviously, we are a member, I'm with the city of Atlanta, obviously we're a member of the MPO and actively engaged in it. But do you see any unique role that particularly central cities can play in this process? I guess that's the answer. Well, I, I, I certainly see a role. I just don't know what it is. But I mean, I, I, no, but I'm serious. I can't define it. But the cities or agglomerations of cities are going to be critical to making something like this work. Okay, you, you can't just say, OK, we now have our super MPO. You know, and, and, you know, and then yet you're still going to need regional planning. Like when I first began, I pointed out, if you're looking at commuter sheds, which have to be looked at, then that's really at the MPO level. And that's not going to go away from that level. But if you're looking at the freight movements in the economy, then that's a larger scale. And so somehow these two are going to have to be reconciled. Uh, I, I think the central city uh, should function as a glue. And they provide the, uh, promote the campaign. And this is our region. And make, you know, bringing, engaging more other you know, partnerships and uh, infill them. Uh, f f uh, we are team, you know, like some kind of identity. Okay, Piedmont Atlantic is a good name. Naming is, I think, important. So everybody here and then feel, okay, Piedmont Atlantic, we are Piedmont Atlantic. Then it makes a region identified by other people and then uh, 
uh, bond too strongly. I mean, I can think of the uh, you know, city of San Diego in our regions, the uh, city of LA in the Southern California mega region. Those cities definitely have uh, an impact in that their mayors or elected officials carry a lot of weight when we have those conversations with other partners about working together. So having a champion at the local level is always important. So my question to you all is, MAP21 has directed the US DOT to develop the National Freight Strategic Plan. This process will essentially involve seeking input from states and others in the development, in the development of the first ever plan to identify a range of freight considerations, including existing networks, sources of freight congestions, major trade gateways, and national freight corridors. My question to the panel or anyone in the room is, um, how will that process of developing a national freight strategic plan help support the mega regions, um, the understanding of the mega regions? Well, I can start, you know, that we, uh, we're working also with the California Department of Transportation to, to come up with a state plan that you know, is going to inform or, or hopefully influence the, the national plan. Uh, what's important is the funding also. Uh, plans are good, but they need backing with funding, and that hasn't been forthcoming yet. It's, it's clear you know, from the work we did in our study with the FAF that the national freight movements are important to understanding the overall, uh, as the economy of a mega region works as a unit, then the national understanding of what it imports and what it exports is important. But I also have to say that in developing our, our statewide model and then our mega regions model, the, one of our larger headaches was local freight movements, like less than 50 miles. That, that was a big headache, and it, it was, that was more difficult to model than the national movements. So when you have to think of freight, you have to think across the spectrum. Development of the state freight plans, which is also a freight provision as part of Map 21, will get at some of the local um, freight movements and a better understanding of the local situation as part of the state plans. <coughs> Since those plans will essentially feed into the development of national um, freight strategic plans. I think uh, the problem still is uh, the data availability for the local level. So we heavily depend on the uh, FAF data, uh, which covers nation as uh, with uh, 123 zones only. And uh, one of our UTC project uh, to fill that gap, uh, depending on the ATRI's GPS data, uh, which is uh, uh, available, but it doesn't cover uh, lots of uh, attributes that we are looking for. It, it, it is there. It, it will improve some of the analysis that we do for the local level, but uh, uh, there are a lot of things that still cannot be covered with those data available. So, when there's a MAP 22 yesterday, so as part of MAP 22, do you think that maybe a funding mechanism of some sort, if, if possible, when the new reauthorization comes about, that speaks to maybe uh, a funding mechanism to be put in place for local jurisdictions to acquire necessary data set would be a benefit? Because these are ideas that I could potentially take back to Washington, D.C. Yeah. I would no, say yes. yes. No. <laughs> no. Yes. Give us the data. No, I hear yes. <laughs> Just give us the data. I mean, and I'm sorry for the speak out of term, but I mean, you're hitting at something that's really, you know, uh, you know, for a small MPO like uh, like Birmingham, it's important to us. The best thing that's happened in this whole federal process right now is to hear data. Um, you know, because we were struggling with the, you know performance measures and travel time, and when you know when you know the feds came back and said, here's travel time data. It's free. Use it. You know, that was probably the best thing that's happened to us. You know, so like the gentleman pointed out, you know, we looked at um, purchasing, you know, some of the private data. And when we looked at the cost of it, you know, for us, it was prohibitive. It, it would have been a third of my annual budget, my PL budget to do that. So it was just flat out prohibitive. We approached the state about it, and because we don't have, you know, they're not necessarily, I'm not going to say necessarily interested, but it, it, it turned out to be prohibitive for them as well. So 
provide, just giving us the data, you know, just, you know, you know, doing what you did with the travel time data, purchase it, and then give it to us. And then we'll, we'll run with it. <laughs> I mean, I reiterate, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, instead of providing a funding source for data, if, if there could be a national, national purchase, maybe of some of that uh, private data, the proprietary data that's out there, say transfers or entry data or something like that, where you, you can get at it, and then it made available to everyone, um, that would be definitely be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, at the uh, Appalachian Regional Commission mm -hmm. has been exploring. They've been doing things like that um, by doing some cooperative purchases to lower the price for everyone on, on some, some of that data. It'd be, it'd be some, something similar. I, I would have one further recommendation, though. If you go with that, purchasing the data, you really need to carefully think through what the purpose of this data is and what you want to be able to do with it when you're done, okay? Because we purchased data on dollar flows, and we could use it for a whole range of things. The particular thing we used was for transportation, but that could have been used for the economy. I mean, it, it could have been used to track banking flows. You know, So exactly what is the purpose and what do you want to be able to do and to make sure that you've, you've fully specified that before you start, before you start recommending the purchase. I think we have a question at the center table. A lot of the mega region discussion, or at least it sounds like it, it, it could be portrayed this way, possibly involves a different level of government or a new level of government. With the current political climate, what do you think the probability is that the public or, or Washington, D.C. would accept having another level of government being involved in our lives? Can you want to answer that one? Well, you know, we're, we sort of started looking at collaboration uh, as kind of what the tools that we have now. Um, but I think if we look at this issue of, of, of economic competitiveness and the question becomes what do we need to be more competitive, uh, this idea of bringing a mega regions, a more integrated a, a view of freight into our national freight task force, that that kind of issue uh, permeates up to the very top is really important, a national freight strategic plan. Then it seems to me the question becomes what entities are most involved? We know those are our cities, our MPOs, our DOTs. That's a three-party conversation I would suggest that could sit down and even initially Initially, if it's a collaborative kind of discussion, out of that, I think we can frame at least an initial approach for how we get into the game, because right now, we are not in the game. That's the point everybody has made. Fred, I thought, made it very, very well, a number of us. So, so that's kind of what we've started. It's not great, but it's kind of working. All of you are here. Um, and I'm not so sure the answer is another level of government. I think I like to try to start off what is the end and then back into how we get there rather than saying, you know, well, I, I, and I understand, believe me. Uh, so I think, where do we need, what's the end, and then how do we get from where we are now to that end? Maybe it's fractured or broken, it's not whole, but it represents at least some progress. And that's been our approach, uh, I think, as is evident from everything we've said today. It just seems like it does exactly counter everything you hear about economic development, which is competition between cities, competition between counties, between states, okay. Uh, this manufacturer, that manufacturer, the, the idea of cooperation just doesn't seem to be Oh, I, I guess I would disagree a little bit with that. We've learned some lessons. It's certainly our history. On a going forward basis, I think we embrace that at our own uh, peril. And, and I think we're smart enough at some point. Because the idea of, I look at what we're doing with Birmingham right now. We're actually developing a modeling capability that's going to be, will be linked to two different states. It's never been done. We started at the analytical piece of it. We'll be able to have a very intelligent conversation and figure out what can we do jointly and what still are issues that we have to address in our own particular location. That we've only focused on our particular location. There's a whole world out there that's collaborative and joint that we've totally ignored, which speaks to your point. This is the opportunity to address that. And it's imperative to our own national and global competition. There's no doubt about that. Industries can compete but agree on standards. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe that's it. But, Catherine, I know we're at, we are at time. And yes. I know you're getting me yesterday on time. What do you want? I, like, I love this conversation, but do we need to move on? We actually do. We need to go to. This is going to be continued in our breakout sessions. And, Haley, where is she?
Okay. Let me thank the She's speakers good. one last time. Yeah, thank great you, job. Thank you, Michael.